chapter 4. <clears throat> There was a, a wonderful attraction about Jesus Christ which drew the crowds. There was something about him. And uh, all sorts of people, the educated, the uneducated, the high caste, the low caste, the religious, Pharisees and Sadducees, the tax collectors, the prostitutes, they all came to hear him and to see him. And if you look at Matthew chapter 4, verse 23, you'll read this. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. News about him spread all over Syria, and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon-possessed, those having seizures and the paralyzed, and he healed them. Large crowds from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and the region across the Jordan followed him. And then when you finish in Matthew 4, you come to that famous Matthew chapter 5, which is the Beatitudes. And uh, chapter 5, verse 1, reads like this, 1 and 2. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. Now when Jesus saw the crowds... It's very important to read the Bible in context. He saw the condition of the crowds. He saw they were hopeless and helpless and lost in sin. They were like sheep without a, sh a shepherd. They were scattered. There was no one to lead them. And he had compassion on them. People were expecting Jesus, of course, to come and deal with the Roman Empire and free them from bondage, but Jesus had come to free them from something much worse than the bondage of Rome, to free them from sin. Seeing the crowds, he went up on a mountain. Now, why did he do that? Did he say, let's have an evangelism seminar? Did he? No. He knew that if the disciples were to reach the crowds, their characters would have to be right. He was going to instruct his disciples so that they might minister to the crowds. Everything's upside down these days. It's all about doing, doing, doing. Remember Theresa May, when she was appointed as Prime Minister, she said this, When it comes to opportunity, we won't entrench the advantages of the fortunate few. We will do everything we can to help anyone, whatever your background, to go as far as your talents will take you. Do you remember that statement? That was her manifesto. Always amuses me, actually, somehow, that kind of manifesto. You know, you hear people say in America, well, you can do anything you like. You could even become the president. No, you couldn't. <laughs> Get realistic. It's absurd. But it's a manifesto. It's a nice way of talking. But God's <coughs> manifesto is entirely different. God's manifesto is entirely different. And it's here in these verses. And let's read together Matthew 5, verse 1. Now, when Jesus saw the crowds... He went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. 
Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, <coughs> and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Jesus doesn't say blessed is the man, blessed is the woman who does something. You notice that? His approach is quite different. He said, blessed is the man who is something. Blessed is the woman who is something. Forgive me if I don't keep saying men and women. When I say men, I mean women as well. You know that. <clears throat> Just shortens the sermon a little. <clears throat> he doesn't talk about conduct, but about character. The only, the only thing that's of any value in the kingdom of heaven in terms of what we do, is in terms of what we do that arises out of our character. Yes. That's all. And uh, Jesus was determined to reach the multitudes and he knew that if he, was, if he was going to do that, he needed to instruct these disciples about character. Now this was the character of Jesus Christ, wasn't it? The Beatitudes are the characteristics of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, says um, John, 1 John, he says, He that says he abides in him ought himself also so to walk, even as Jesus walked. Is that walking in heaven? No. We're told that even as Jesus walked on the earth, so are we to walk. What a challenge is that? Blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You know that word blessed is the word happy. Happy. That is to be in a place of peace. It's not happy clapping, false smiles, not like that. It's to be in peace and joy and rest. That's what God wants for us. That's happiness. Remember what Paul said to Timothy? He said, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, of the happy God, the God who is at perfect peace and rest, wants to give us his perfect peace and rest. When peace, like a river, <coughs> attendeth my soul, if everything else is going wrong, the world's falling apart around us, and certainly we're not smiling very much. But there's something deep down that is at peace and rest. God offers what men strive to obtain but fail to obtain outside of him. They, they, they strive to obtain happiness but never find it except in Jesus Christ. And here's Jesus now looking at the crowds with all the desperate need and saying, now here comes God to bring them this genuine <coughs> happiness. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Why, Jesus, did you start there? You do realise, of course, that Jesus never speaks in a haphazard way. He speaks in a measured way. He speaks in a logical way. He speaks in an orderly way. These aren't just put together in any order. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And everything else that follows in the beatitude follows from that, from those that are poor in spirit. Because there is no entry into the kingdom of heaven unless we're poor of spirit. Hallelujah. You see, first of all, I'm, te I'm, t I'm telling you things you already know. I'm just reminding you of things, that's all. Before God can fill us, we have to become empty. There's got to be an emptiness before there's a filling. There's got to be a death before there's a resurrection. Do you remember Simeon 
holding Jesus, remember him saying this, this child is set for the falling and rising of many. Have you fallen yet? Because if you haven't fallen yet, you certainly haven't risen yet. If you haven't come before God in utter poverty of spirit, you certainly are not a candidate for the kingdom of heaven. Sheila's favourite saying, which actually was Martin Luther's saying, was God can do nothing with a man until a man becomes nothing. He's not talking about being poor, materially speaking. It's about our attitude towards ourselves. What's your attitude towards yourself this morning? See, this is totally contrary to the wisdom of the world. It talks about self-confidence. You can do anything. Self-assertion, self-expression. How often do you hear people say, you've got to believe in yourself? That's man's great problem. Or expressed in the words of that famous song, I did it my way. I've had to take a number of funerals for non-Christians where we have exited to that awful song. I did it my way. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, do you remember that lovely hymn written by Wesley, Jesus, lover of my soul, let me to thy bosom fly. Well, this is one verse, and I notice in updated versions they've changed it a bit. They always want to change truth, you know. This is what he said, Thou, O Christ, art all I want. More than all in thee I find. Raise the fallen, cheer the faint, heal the sick and lead the blind. Just and holy is thy name, here it is, I am all unrighteousness. False and full of sin I am, thou art full of grace and truth. Do you find modern choruses singing like this? I don't. I don't see it. I'm not saying they're all bad, please. I'm not being an old misery. I see very little of that. If you've never faced God with this kind of poverty, you haven't met him at all. You remember what Isaiah said? For this is what the high and exalted one says, who lives forever, whose name is holy. Lord, where do you live? I live in the high and holy place. You remember that, where all the seraphims are, worshipping and saying, oh, that's where I live, that's where I live. But I also live, he says, with the one who is contrite and lowly in spirit, to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contract. Oh, hallelujah. It's good to be nothing, you know. It's good to be nothing. It's good to acknowledge in the presence of God you are absolutely nothing apart from him. Remember Gideon? And he said to him, O oh my Lord, this is Gideon talking to God, with which shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. Do you think kind of humility from Gideon? David, who am I that you should come to me? There it is again. Moses, who was the most humble man on the earth. <laughs> Read about him and see his humility. Isaiah, woe to me, for I am undone. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I am live, living among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King. Have you come to that place? Peter, that naturally assertive, demonstrative character, always at the head of the queue, he'd been told to follow Jesus, not to go back fishing. Back he went to fishing, he went twice actually, if you look. You see him right at the end of John. <laughs> he said he was going to follow him. And, and even in that state 
of disobedience, Jesus comes along with that wonderful miracle and he catches all that fish and he says, depart from me, O Lord, for I am a sinful man. This is, this is the loneliness I'm talking about. This is the, the emptying that God brings to men and women. And then Jesus, our prime and wonderful example, he, as God, becomes a man and can, says, I can do nothing of myself. And then he's, he says, and you've already quoted it this morning, Alex, come unto me. Now, to me, this is the most remarkable verse, to me, just to me, this is the most remarkable voice, verse in the whole of the Bible. I am stunned by it. I've spoken on it many times in different places. I'm utterly stunned by this. Come unto me, all you that labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek. Is this God speaking? For I am meek. I'm humble. I'm lowly in heart. And you shall find rest unto your souls. You know when God took a bit of dust and made a man. And Adam woke up and saw God. He was totally dependent upon him. In utter humility, and then comes along Satan, this great boastful being, this proud one who was not humble, the very antithesis of humility, and came to Adam and Eve, and the humility had gone. That was man's trouble. And Jesus Christ brought back humility by way of example to us. It's an absence of pride, an absence of self-reliance, a consciousness of nothing in the presence of God. How do you feel about yourself? Feeling low? Praise God. I could say all sorts of things. Best be low, and then God will raise you up. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. That's the best. Amen. Remember that story again, the tax collector and the publican, they come into the temple and the publican says, oh, I thank you, God, I'm not like other men, not like him, not like him. And in comes the tax collector, beating his breast, looking down and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Well, is this just a one-off, this? Is this just to enter the kingdom of heaven or no? God expects from us ongoing humility. Paul said, I've come to Corinth in weakness and in much trembling. No strutting on a stage as a preacher for him. Not strutting around pretending, you know, this great personality. Not for Paul. Paul had met the living God. And they said of his, his appearance is weak and his speech contemptible. How would you like that as a preacher? Or anyone? How'd they like, how, how would you like that? He can't speak properly. It's contemptible. Blessed are those. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I'm not going to go through them all this morning, don't worry. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. How can you be happy if you mourn? It seems like a, a paradox. It seems like an absurdity. Blessed are those who mourn. How can you equate mourning with happiness? Are you a mourning one? Good. That's what it says. Blessed are the mourning ones. Not blessed are those who once mourned. That's the sense of it. It's the immediate, continuing sense. Blessed are the mourning ones. <clears throat> you know, the world says, forget your troubles, get an escape, pack up your troubles in your old kit bag. That World War I sense. And smile. Oh dear. Smile, smile. Get a distraction. Now he's not talking about the mourning of a person who's lost a relative. He's not talking about that. He's talking about something spiritual. Now we're not called to be miserable, please. We're not called to be miserable. We're not called to be walking around with some kind of solemn, long face. 
nor are we called to be unnecessarily jovial. I believe that. I have to find myself in that sometimes. Uh, you know, it, 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 there's, sometimes there's a falsehood about that. I'm going to ask a question in a moment. Did Jesus ever laugh? Think about it. Think about it in a moment. But Paul, Paul is saying, in my flesh dwells no good thing. Do you say that? In my flesh, Lord, I've discovered it. The Holy Spirit has revealed to me that in my flesh there's just putrid, awful things. There's nothing of any value whatever. Any works that I do apart from this character that Jesus is describing is of no value in terms of eternity. Paul talks like this in Romans, not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption. Of Are you groaning inwardly? Sometimes when you look at yourself. He writes to Timothy and Titus and he says this, the aged men are to be sober. How about that? They're to be sober, grave, temperate, and the young men to be sober-minded. When did you last hear that from the pulpit? You young men are to be sober-minded. Now if you're genuinely poor in spirit, inevitably you'll be a morning one. I bet you're glad you came this morning, aren't you? I'm just trying to be real. I'm just trying to be real in the midst of so much falsehood. When you look at the holiness of God and see how short you come of that holiness, you discover your own incompetence to rule yourself, your own unworthiness, your own failure. There is a mourning over sin which is utterly correct. And Jesus said it would happen. But here it is. He will be comforted. Hallelujah. Morning comfort, morning comfort, morning comfort. Is that your life? If it is, praise God. You're totally in line with this teaching. If you love me, says Jesus, you will obey what I command. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another comforter, comforter to be with you forever. The Spirit of Truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. So I want to encourage us. <clears throat> and you maybe do this already, or perhaps not as a daily discipline. That doesn't matter in, in so far as it's an ongoing discipline. You get to the end of the day and you realise how far you've fallen short. You realise you've said things that you shouldn't have said. You've thought things that you shouldn't have thought. You've allowed your thoughts to run right. You've reacted to people the way you shouldn't have reacted. And you become smitten. And you turn to God for cleansing. That's repentance. Ongoing. Ongoing repentance. And there's an advocate above who's lived as a man and knows all about it and is dealing with all of your sin. Hallelujah. Here's another old hymn. Another Wesley hymn. We used to sing the old Wesley hymn, she and I, 20, 25 verses in the fellowship we once were. We used to call them hymns. They were actually a hymn that was called Hymns of Eternal Truth. We used to call them Hymns of Eternal Length. <laughs> You know, you know the Methodists in those days, they sang them and sang them and sang them over and over again to imbibe truth. That's what they did. And um, you know when you look in the Red Book, they're just truncated versions of those. But here's one of his. Jesus, my advocate above, my friend before the throne of love, if now for me prevails thy prayer, if now I find thee leading there, if thou the secret wish convey, and sweetly prompt my heart to pray, 
hear and hear my weak petitions join, Almighty Advocate tonight. You see what he's talking about? He's talking about this morning. Jesus, my heart's desire obtain, my earnest and suit present and gain, my fullness of corruption show. Well, are we singing like that anymore? Lord, show me the fullness of my corruption. I don't hear it anymore. The knowledge of myself bestow. What is better than knowing yourself when God's Holy Spirit has revealed it to you? And this isn't miserable. This is glorious. Save me from death, from hell set free. Death, hell are but the want of thee. My life and my only heaven thou art. O oh, might I feel thee in my heart. Hallelujah. Thank goodness we have got some good modern hymns that do express these. But there aren't very many. And Jesus mourned over the sins of others. Blessed are the mourning ones. And, and this, is, this is what he expects of us. To be, to be mourning. You know, I felt this degree of mourning this week when I saw that 14-year-old girl who died of cancer who wanted to be cryogenically frozen. I felt a mourning in my heart. How sad is that? A 1% chance, though, who could come up with those kind of statistics, I don't know. Of her ever being resuscitated, I would say a nil percent chance of her being resuscitated. But what a tragedy, bless her. What a tragedy that she now shares a fridge with five people. What a tragedy. And I find this when I go to hospital as well. I look around and I see the consequences of, of the fallen nature of man. And all the misery that goes with it. I'm not, I'm not saying, you know, these are miserable places. Praise God, people come through. But you've just got to look. There's a mourning in my heart. And I believe that's from God. Blessed are the mourning ones. Jesus mourned, didn't he? Did he laugh? <clears throat> Can you find a single verse or reference to him laughing? No, I think he did. I think he did. But his demeanour was not one of laughter. Isaiah said he was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. I'm sure he laughed. But when he got to the grave of Lazarus, what did he do? He convulsed with weeping. Not because Lazarus had died, because he was about to live again. But the whole notion of death, the whole concept of death caused him to convulse. He mourned over death that he'd come to deal with. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. Sorrowful, but not morose. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying this morning. I'm not suggesting we shouldn't laugh. Laughter's good medicine, apparently, from the scriptures we're told, isn't it? I'm not saying we shouldn't laugh. I'm not saying we shouldn't enjoy ourselves. But this was the demeanor of Jesus. Sorrowful, but not morose. Not miserable. Not solemn. In fact, he was the most approachable man on the earth. Wasn't he? Not pious in sort of pretending to be spiritual. But if ever you've got a problem, you'd have gone to him, <laughs> wouldn't you? And finally, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. These two first Beatitudes lead to this one. Now, these people were waiting for some kind of military deliverance. But notice that Jesus, listen, my kingdom's not like that. My kingdom is for those who are meek. They're the ones that will inherit the earth. You remember Abraham and Lot, they'd both done well in the land of Canaan, but there wasn't enough grazing for them. So Abraham said, you take one, you go one way, I'll go the other. That's, that's meekness. 
And of course, a lot goes off to the, the place of wickedness, but the grazing is better. Abraham goes to the other place, but God says, actually, you're going to inherit the whole lot. You're going to have the whole lot. Moses describes as the meekest man on the earth. See how he was prepared to humble himself. He could have had all the pleasures of Egypt. Moses, and the writer to Hebrews says, By faith Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Consider the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. That's meekness. David, look at the way he dealt with Saul, and Saul was so horrible to him, trying to kill him. That's meekness. Jeremiah, a lonely man. Leonard Ravenhill used to say, I don't know whether you've ever read any of Leonard Ravenhill, but sometimes people would come to him and say, God's called me as a prophet. He used to say, you better get yourself an insurance policy, life insurance policy. These prophets spoke truth and they were alone much of the time. They were criticised, they were condemned. But what a man he was. What a humble, what a humble and meek man he was. And Jesus, I just read that verse to you, take my yoke upon you and learn from me for a mind gentle. On the cross, I remember when I was a boy reading Campbell Morgan and he described this as strength under control. I like that. He was oppressed, treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep is silent before his shears, he did not open his mouth. What about that for meekness from the Son of God himself? Philippians 2, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used for his event. What about that meekness from the Son of God? Now meekness is not being weak. Or always in the background. Nice and quiet. You know, one who compromises. Let's all agree for the sake of peace. That's not meekness. Meekness is great strength and authority and power under control. Hallelujah. That's what it is. Pride has to go. The meek are not proud of themselves and their achievements. They know they've got no right. So a preacher friend of mine, a very gracious man, said to me, he, he, this man preaches all over the world, but he said sometimes he'd get a letter pointing out all his faults. Though why, he's a lovely man. But that's what happens sometimes. He would read the letter and he would say to himself, no, it's much worse than you're saying. <laughs> that's the best you can do. No, no, if I know, I'm much worse than that. See, that's meekness. That's meekness. Doesn't retaliate. Doesn't demand its rights. Doesn't defend itself. Let's face it, sometimes we defend ourselves, don't we? We do. There's that in us which defends ourselves. I look back at my my life earlier on and I, come on, I was forever defending myself. That's not meekness. Jesus did not defend himself. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Now finally, he says, such a man, such a woman inherits the earth now, for all things are ours. That's what he says. And there's a time in the future when we shall inherit the earth as we sit with Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Let me just read this scripture and I'll close here as having nothing but possessing all things, says Paul. In Corinthians he says, whether Paul or Apollos, or Cephas, or the world, or life, or death, or the present or the future, all of them belong to you. In Romans, those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry out the Father. The Spirit testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now if we are children, then we are heirs. 
heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. <coughs> Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Brothers and sisters, let's examine ourselves. Let's not hide anything. Let's, let's come before God and just ask him, like in the words of that hymn, Lord, just show us. Show us, Lord. We, we, we want... <coughs> We want, Lord, to live in this way. We understand, Lord, how should we ever reach anyone unless we display the character of Jesus Christ? How, how will he be attractive to men unless he be attractive in us, Lord, in some measure? Teach us, Lord, to examine ourselves Lord, teach us what it is to be poor in spirit, to mourn, to be meek. Let this mind be in us, Lord, which was also in Christ Jesus with us, for your sake and the sake of the gospel. Amen. Amen.